This video is going to be a film study look at Jameer Gibbs' impact with the Lions offense in his rookie season of 2023. I think any attempt to evaluate or analyze his play also has to include at least some comment or mention of the Lions parlaying pick six in last year's first round NFL draft into pick 12, Jameer Gibbs, and pick 34, Sam Laporta. I'll be honest with you, I can't blame Brad Holmes for the way that he called out certain members, specific members of the media last week for their draft criticisms, uh, dating back to 2021, in fact, but I think also including 2022, when the Detroit kind of went against the grain to take a running back, Gibbs, and inside linebacker Jack Campbell with picks 12 and 18 when originally they had 6 and 18. Um, I, I didn't really pay attention to the Lions, to be honest with you, after the draft in 2021. Other than the fact that Jamar Chase ended up with the Bengals, who passed on Penny Sewell, and the Lions end up with him, certainly don't regret that pick at all, and and clearly don't regret taking a running back in this case Gibbs at pick twelve in two thousand twenty two. An amazing draft overall by the Lions front office, starting with Gibbs. He was at the center of it, I guess I should say, taking that pick twelve after Detroit traded back with the Cardinals. John Robinson goes off the board at pick eight. Lions end up with Gibbs and Jack Campbell after the first round was over. I thought it was a brilliant night uh, back then because the Lions apparently got who they wanted. I mean, if they wanted Robinson, presumably they would have taken him at six, I would guess. I don't think any evaluation of Gibbs can be fully done unless you're talking about Bijan Robinson also being there on the board, number one. And number two, without mentioning that Brad Holmes and those guys were able to turn that into Sam Laporta. Those two got that trade, in my opinion, could go down in history for the Lions. Gibbs and Laporta, if they continue on their current track, let's put it that way. And, and also, feel free to go back and check out my reaction to the Lions' first round last year, their first round selections last year, solely focusing on Gibbs and Jack Campbell, how they were able to accomplish accomplish that. I published that video about 2.15 2 a.m. Eastern Time, Eastern Standard Time, the night of the first round. So before the second round was completed, we did not know that they were going to get Laporta, Brian Branch, um, and Hendon Hooker. I didn't know as much about golf and Brad Holmes as I certainly do now. I'll link that video up in the description or, or comment section so you can check it out if you want and see what I said on draft night. So let's get to some of the film or, or at least some of the stats, I should say, about Gibbs. My, le my lead-ins have obviously been a little too long lately. There's been a couple comments about that, and I, I don't disagree with those people at all. Um, from here on out, we'll focus on his impact on the field with one more comment about draft night uh, at the end. Look, Gibbs' usage clearly increased in volume and, and variety. As the season progressed, as you can clearly see from his stats here, his game-by-game -game stats with the totals at the bottom, double figures in carries in nine of his last 11 games in the regular season, ending with um, 182 rushing attempts and 71 pass targets in 15 games played. So almost 16, almost 17 touches per game, excuse me. And, and I think that's a significant number because you have him, and when you do have him and, and David Montgomery healthy, this offense has a lot of options in the run game and the pass, clearly. But I think Gibbs offers dual or perhaps a trio of assignments when he's on the field. He's not just an outside runner, and I'll try to show that um, in this video. Clearly, he had an impact as a pass catcher, finishing with 52 catches on 71 pass targets and only one receiving touchdown. I think that was against the Broncos. I went back and looked, and, and DeAndre Swift actually had 62 catches in his second year in Detroit uh, back in 2021, had a couple of other uh, seasons where he had just under 50 catches. I would expect that Gibbs' past touches are going to remain about the same. I wouldn't expect him to see more than the 70 targets he got this year. In fact, it might be less uh, with more targets going to Jamison Williams. But Laporta and St. Brown are going to be heavy usage guys uh, in terms of their total number of targets. Let's put it that way. Let's get to some of the film, and we'll focus on his outside rushes first, which I think is where you maybe need to start. If you're going to talk about uh, what Gibbs offers, he was labeled as a speed back, far more versatile. I think that's obvious after watching his rookie season. But even his film at Alabama wasn't all just stretch runs, toss stuff, uh, pin pull like you see here. But given that he ran a 4.36 at the combine, he also averaged over six yards per carry in his one year at Alabama. 10 total touchdowns, you can understand why he was labeled a speed back. I think he's a threat to the field where you see this play being run against San Francisco or either side, and I'll, I'll show his boundary side uh, runs here in a little bit. 
He offers significant advantage, if you if you ask me, because he forces defenders to kind of overreact or freezes them with uh, any step. In this case, his little step or jab to the left holds these guys just long enough such that other blockers can work up to them. Additionally, you have soul pulling opposite, which is a run concept I'll cover in detail a little bit later in this video. So those inside linebackers don't know where the ball is necessarily going. I think 57 takes a really poor angle. But look, Gibbs can can cut back. Once he threatens the edge, he can cut back inside. Or some people would say, you know, bang it downhill. Once he finds a, a lead blocker who he, can, who he can cut off of. He really, if you ask me, hit his stride in week 7, 8, and 9 against the, the Ravens, Raiders, and Chargers. In terms of total touches and total impact statistically, let's let's put it that way. He totaled 427 yards from scrimmage in those three games, uh, four rushing touchdowns, also had 18 catches on 20 targets in that, that, that stretch, week seven, eight, and nine. I'll have more, more on his um, threat as a receiver later. I also think you have to mention any offense that Ben Johnson is in charge of at this point, his usage of boundary side runs. And I think I've covered this in multiple other videos, but we'll do this specifically here. I think I, re I really enjoy how Johnson and the offensive staff utilize Gibbs everywhere, but especially on run attacks to the boundary, which is something I think they make a point of doing. This is down sweep, or I call it down sweep. The center and the guard pulling. Usually it's those two, actually, I should say. Usually it's the center and the guard pulling, and, and that lets Gibbs follow the track of the center as the second puller. So you can see that the, the guard is pulling and he's the kicker, kick out, and then the center is pulling to wrap. And in this case, Gibbs fits neatly in that space between the kick out block and the center fall, happens to fall down here. Gibbs is able to navigate that track. Look, many other teams do use this. I, I don't think anyone utilizes this um, as well as the Lions, at least in my opinion. And I'm and really, I don't know where this play originates at the NFL level. I think it's perfect for Gibbs' ability to burst off of either foot. And the reason why I call it down is because it's usually going to a three-man surface where you have a tight end along with a tackle and a guard. And down in the terminology that I was taught would be down blocks on the front side, guard pulling and kicking out. Now, in this case, down sweep is the center being added to it and I think you can really only do this efficiently at the NFL level if you have a, a speed back, a guy who can get through there quickly and then understands where to cut and how to read it, how to gear down from maybe fifth or fourth gear, how to gear down to third momentarily and then put the speed back on, uh, shift back into fourth or fifth gear. I think it's a – look, the Lions do a great job of blocking uh, this stuff at all levels, all right? And I, and I think that accentuates the danger on these boundary side – uh, runs, if you ask me. This one is kind of a little bit of a stretch to say boundary side run. The ball is uh, closer to the right hash, but but more so would probably still be uh, considered you know closer to the right hash than it would be to the boundary, so a little bit wider space to the left, if you ask me. Still running it to what I would say is a three-man surface. You've got 12 personnel, so two tight ends on the field to the left. Brock Wright is the third man with the left guard and the left tackle. And he'll release inside. Again, you've got the kick out block and then the wrap by 60 here. Gibbs is following that track perfectly off of 60's backside, if you ask me. I think it's a beautiful concept. One that, like I said, multiple other teams use. The fact that they're doing out of a same side run with a little bit of counter step by Gibbs, I think is uh, makes it a little bit more dangerous because now he can hit this thing 100 miles an hour off of that little counter step, that little back step. This last one is against the Broncos. This is a third and 10 in the third quarter. And, and De Denver's defense got run over all day. Gibbs finished with 100 yards on 11 carries. And he followed that up the next week, by the way, with 100 yards from scrimmage against the Vikings. This third down run stuff, if you ask me, is, is fun and pure um, entertainment. Some would say, I'm not sure how long you can continue to do this. NFL teams will be prepared for it. I think that's the point. I think there's some real deep thought into this from the Lions coaching staff's perspective, meaning they're trying to force people, the defense, to 
defend a wider array of concepts on third and six, third and seven. This happens to be a third and 10. Number one, number two, out of 11 personnel, you can see the tight ends on the other side. This is what makes Iman Ross St. Brown so versatile and why I continue to say I think he's one of the best players in the NFL uh, at any position. He's asked to block at the point of attack on a third and 10. It's not really a sweep uh, action from the, the linemen. They're just trying to zone this. They're just trying to reach. And in this case, Decker's cutting off someone on the backside. You still do have the guard pulling and kicking, and that's exactly where Gibbs uh, kind of kicks or uh, uh, leads this off of to get the first down 11 yards on a third and 10 into the boundary. I, I love their commitment to the run, even when from a timing perspective, and what I mean by that timing is when the rest of the NFL seeds the run, third and 10, third and six, third and four even, the Lions retain that threat. And I think that Jameer Gibbs is a big part of that because when he's on the field, he's a better pass catcher, better threat out of the backfield than David Montgomery, who had some good moments this year out of the backfield as a, as a receiver, don't get me wrong. But when Gibbs is on the field, third and 10, third and six, okay, it's a pass. They maintain the threat of the run even to the wide receiver side. In this case, I'm in Ross St. Brown. I think there's a lot more to be said for that. Uh, possibility with that being a standalone video later on. You guys let me know what you think of that. All right, shifting gears a little bit in terms of the type of run plays that Gibbs is used on, zone stuff into the boundary. In this particular case, it's going to be run to uh, two tight end side. This, so this is 12 personnel in the home playoff win against the Bucks In the divisional round, there's multiple concepts. That it's an unpredictable run game on some level. These three plays that I'm going to show you here, the first one's going to be to the side where you have Laporta and Wright lined up at tight end. Just pure physicality. I'm picking that. It's only a five-yard gain by Gibbs, by the, by the way. And other running backs could get these five yards, clearly. You got just pure physicality up front with these guys trying to win. Uh, the unblocked player, the backside edge player, uh, number zero, Diaby, I believe, gets involved with it. Vita Ve has been bumped into the front side, and then he shrugs off Ragnow, is also involved there. But to me, Gibbs is more than just a, a, a speed back. He's not a power back, certainly. He runs harder. He reminds me of P Isaiah Pacheco, or they remind me of each other, I should say, because they're a whole lot stronger than people think, and they break tackles. They're really difficult to get down. He offers the ability to get into these dog fights. I would say this plays a dog fight and threaten the outside on it such that the potential for the cut downhill is there, number one, but he also is is great on speed stuff. That's that's I, You didn't need me to show you the first three or four plays to understand or recognize that he's great on outside run concepts to the field or the boundary. What I like here on the next two is these are zone concepts. They're not just to the boundary, but they're away from the tight end. In fact, and this might be a new concept, from, from the way I try to explain it. Other people don't think about the game the way I do, and, and that's fine. This is to the one receiver side. So once St. Brown motions through here, this is obviously at home against Atlanta. Once St. Brown motions through, there's only one guy off screen here. You've got the left guard, left tackle, typical, and then off screen is a wide receiver. Look at the, at the NFL and college level, at all levels. There's a lot of people who will not run direct flow run concepts to a one receiver side. Now, you, in Detroit, they have a great offensive line, so that's a part of it. You have guys who can who can reach here, or, or in the case of maybe not reaching, Sewell was playing left tackle here, by the way. Sewell and Jackson haven't reached. They've just expanded these guys, so basically expanded them further in that direction, and also Ragnow is going to try to get up after comboing uh, to the inside linebacker level, try to combo up to the second level, excuse me. So there's a lot of parts to this. You have to have a great offensive line. Gibbs goes for 21, so... Credit the offensive line for this. Decker's out. That's why Sewell is, is at left tackle. you got to be able to, you know, scoop or, or deal with this D tackle by yourself as the right guard such that the center can help out the left guard, combo up to the boundary side inside linebacker, and inside of all of that, I think the backside inside linebacker gave himself up here uh, by cutting underneath. But in any case, you got to be able to execute this stuff at the offensive line. They can do that. This – from a Gibbs perspective, when the concept is supposed to hit now, he does so. Downhill, slight a jitter there with it with his feet and his hips. 
almost takes it to the house because he's, he's reading Jonah Jackson's block on the three technique. And since Jackson has expanded that guy towards the sideline, Gibbs cuts underneath, ends up juking someone. Look, he can be used on anything. You guys know that as a Lions fan. I do think that there's something to be said for running to a, to a one-receiver side. Finally, another one. This is against the Bucks. Again, there's only one receiver over here, and it's into the boundary. There's a lot of people who will not do this. If you can handle the boundary side inside linebacker and the boundary side edge player, you've got a great opportunity. And, and Ben Johnson knows the look that he's going to get. He knows the front that you're going to get here. Since it's 11 personnel, you've got the tight end to the field, into the bunch. You're going to get the three technique to the field or, or someone who maybe is in a two. You're going to get the one to the boundary, and that's the key here. They know the look they're going to get. They understand that the receiver can go seal off the backside inside linebacker. All these guys here can just down block the front side, whether they're picking up the D-tackle or comboing with the D-tackle or working to the backside inside linebacker, which is what Decker has done here. He's on the backside inside linebacker. The receiver is pinning down on the boundary side inside linebacker. Also, you've got a little counter flow action from Gibbs. I wouldn't call it a counter play, even though the, the right tackle is pulling. Uh, we would just call it a counter flow, meaning if a team runs this play at inside linebacker, you can't commit too heavy. Well, there's really not much that this guy can do here because he's going to get sealed off by the wide receiver. That first step brings him downhill a little bit, more towards the bottom of our screen somewhat, and then Gibbs with his speed is able to change directions abruptly and follow Sewell, who gets collisioned by Shaq Barrett. It's a great concept. I think they ran it twice. This one, in this case, um, happens to be eight yards into the boundary. Beautiful concept, and I think a lot of it is made possible because of how fast, how, how abrupt Jameer Gibbs' uh, uh, speed, his change of direction, actually is. Let's get into a little bit of Gibbs' usage as a receiver and how I think he's he's unique, even at the NFL level. There's a, there's other people who who threaten uh, inside linebackers, nickel defenders. I think his usage, oftentimes in pass concepts, is to the boundary. Uh, one place I think he's got significant potential, even still, that can be expanded upon is is against split field quarters coverages, things that allow secondary guys, nickel defenders, corners, safeties. To, to read one half of the field, reading inside out, whether it's two to one or three to one, and, and they're independent of, re of reading the back. Creating space for Gibbs against inside linebackers. Now, this is uh, third or fourth quarter, I think, against the Bears, is, is just almost like cheating. And you'll see multiple examples of this in this little portion of the video that I'm showing you here. Another thing to mention, and everyone knows this, is, is that his ability to break tackles and gain something extra, put a little bit extra flavor on the catch beyond just where he catches the football. Now, his yards per catch was, I think he only averaged six yards per catch for the year. 52 catches, maybe 360 um, yards receiving, something like that. That doesn't sound exactly right. I don't have the numbers in front of me. But Gibbs is, in essence, another receiver on the field in terms of what he can do to the defense. And I think that's the part about those third and sixes when he's on the field that makes those, those run concepts on third and six or third and ten, like I showed you a minute ago, a borderline unfair. This stuff, when there's a play action, in this case out of 12 personnel, and then you come back to the running back, is really difficult to deal with and teach your inside linebackers to handle. In this case, uh, Tampa Bay is playing some type of cover two. So once those guys get the wrong read, I'm talking about the inside linebackers, they get depth. There's almost more space created than there would have been if it wasn't a play-action pass because they're getting back so heavily. Most of us are coaching our guys to defend over routes, meaning there's a play-action and some type of over route that's going to hit behind me as an inside linebacker. And in this case, Gibbs, Gibbs is able to get space between in front of the second level. And I think that's one of the one of the things that the Lions could even do more of. I'm not talking about more targets, but strategically target certain guys on the defense who just can't handle, just can't tackle him in that much space. They figured out that it's man here in their home playoff win against the Bucks. I would call it a zig route choice, whatever you want to. Gibbs against the inside linebacker, who's a spectacular football player, but not suited 
to guard an athlete with a change of direction ability uh, like Gibbs. Since Davis followed St. Brown across, additionally, you have eyes on the tight end. Goff pretty much knew that it was man, understood down here into the boundary. These are all just clear out routes, essentially, to look at the, look at the way the routes are breaking and a vertical here. This is all designed to take advantage of Gibbs' ability to win that one-on-one -on -one matchup. On some level, this will limit coverage options for certain defenses. Not every defense. Not a, Certain defenses are going to have inside linebackers they'll trust in that situation. Other teams won't, and the Lions will know that. This will limit options for those teams who don't have a player they're comfortable uh, putting uh, assigning to Jameer Gibbs, number one. Number two, it may force teams to stop this five-down uh, look in certain passing situations. His usage on screens, I think, is is expert by Ben Johnson. Here, they're going to make it look like he possibly could chip Max Crosby. That's why his alignment is just outside of Crosby. You can see Crosby even glanced at him briefly. Doesn't end up being a screen necessarily, but these are route concepts that they use with multiple guys, whereby you have an out and up, a seam route, and then something fitting over top of. One of the landmarks of Ben Johnson's offense, if you ask me, is just outside the hash. Sometimes it's a player who originates from one side of the field and sits down here. You often see Laporta run that route. Clear out route con clear out concept here and an over concept over the top of that landmark. I'm not sure that landmark is a word that you guys have heard, but some teams use a landmark of top of the numbers. I think Ben Johnson's offense in certain situations, third down uh, specifically, utilizes just outside the hash as a landmark. Here's a screen, a really unique one, if you ask me. I don't know if it was designed to come back to this part of the field, but the way Gibbs hits it so abruptly, so quickly, it almost looks like it does. But if you track the offensive linemen, they appear to be uh, setting up to take Gibbs you know, down this side of the field. But because of this player fronting him up, basically being in his field of vision immediately as a potential tackler, Gibbs brings this back against the grain Huge gain on a first and 10. When you get hit for a screen that looks that easy as a defense, uh, it, it's frustrating, number one. Number two, it impacts some of your blitz calls, particularly on first and 10. Against the Ravens, another play action. In fact, fake reverse. Uh, we're lucky, as a Ravens fan, that this one didn't go for a touchdown. As a Lions fan listening, you were hoping that it did. And it almost did. It's a great setup, if you ask me. Fake to the back, to the boundary with the reverse and the tight end bringing flow to this side. So you can see the reaction that it's eliciting from the boundary side corner, in this case, uh, Brandon Stevens and Arthur Millett, the nickel. Huge gain for Gibbs, who had a great – look, a lot of his stats that day, I understand, was in the third and fourth quarter, but he also had touches on the two drives, ending the, th ending the second quarter and beginning the third quarter that the Lions did not score on. Uh, where they very easily could have. So the game you know, would have had a different uh, dynamic. Straight flow here into the boundary, away from the nickel defender. So this is the nickel defender for the Ravens because it's 11 personnel, tight end into the boundary. Ravens are telling you basically that you know this is man coverage into the boundary with Patrick Queen. And instead of anything where Gibbs you know, zigs back into the middle of the field, he's out leveraged Queen. An immediate throw from Goff. One of the things I want to cover in a in a season-long video about Goff that will probably be too long at this point is how quickly he recognizes stuff, how quickly, he, how quickly he's willing to take these shorter completions versus some other quarterbacks, a lot of them, in fact. Goff is a guy who, if you ask me, is very prepared pre-snap and is willing to take whatever's there on multiple concepts. You can see another landmark that I'm talking about, this one in this case, St. Brown, kind of sitting down outside the hash, while from the opposite side, Laporta is running the over-the-top route and almost a wheel to Gibbs to the boundary. He's a significant threat against those inside linebackers. This is the first play I showed you. Look, I, I think when they drafted him, they knew that they were getting a a dangerous pass catcher. I don't know that the rest of the NFL knew how how difficult it was going to be to handle him, and I think this is why 
some people were clamor one of the reasons why some people were clamoring for him to get more usage for him to get more snaps as opposed to David Montgomery I'm not one of those people I frankly don't care I think Gibbs offers more in the pass game and so it's not wrong for people to want to see him get more touches in that regard I think along with more carries occurring in the last 10 11 12 games of the season again double figure carries in 9 of his last 11 games you also had a, a wider net or a wider array of play concepts that he was used on. But we'll show you uh, significant run plays downhill in this set, be it be a duo, split zone, a couple of trap concepts against the Falcons, who I think had a pretty pretty poor run defense overall, and Detroit was able to take advantage of it. Speed guys don't just have to be used to the outside. In fact, there's something to be said about speed guys being used on inside run concepts because they're able to hit stuff downhill so quickly they can get on top of second-level defenders uh, perhaps a little sooner than they're used to with other running backs. I actually really enjoyed some of his downhill run concepts for this video, more so than maybe some of the speed stuff because I think it, it gives him the opportunity once he gets to the second or third level to make one cut and take things to the house, and you'll see two examples of that um, here a little bit later. Split zone against Denver and a, a, a huge, you know, missed tackle by Sertain, who I didn't think had a quality game at all against the Lions from a coverage standpoint or a tackling standpoint. You get a little bit of a better angle of it. 12 personnel is something that I thought earlier in the season Montgomery was the 12 personnel guy. Here you have Laporta. It's actually jumbo personnel because Skipper is the other tight end reported eligible. Split zone, same play as the end zone angle I just showed you a moment ago, leaving the boundary side corner unblocked, in this case Sertain, to go get the boundary side safety with the receiver. Not uncommon. So many teams do that. And Gibbs, not just quick through the hole, not just a difficult tackler, but has the agility to get rid of a guy like Sertain, who's a supreme athlete, even at the NFL level, obviously. Twelve personnel, same formation again. This time it's Laporta and Brock Wright, traditional 12 personnel, ace formation. Split zone, where Brock Wright is kicking out the D end. And then this is the one that Gibbs takes to the house. He had 152 yards on the ground that day against the Raiders. I think you're going to see more of this, meaning more of him being used downhill concepts, where if he gets through to the second level, uh, it could be over. You just have to give credit to not just the way he was utilized and implemented over the course of the season, but Brad Holmes in the front office for drafting him and and having such assuredness that it was the right pick. I know that there were a lot of people, perhaps some Lions fans included, who did not like drafting a running back at 12 and an inside linebacker at 18. The returns on, on Jameer Gibbs were, were higher, obviously, than those on Jack Campbell from a standpoint of splash plays. Uh, but just like Brad Holmes said at his press conference last week, those guys know what they're doing, and it's very intentional, not just who they're drafting, but probably where they're drafting them. This is probably my favorite run of Jameer Gibbs throughout the season. It's a lead zone concept. You'll get the end zone angle here in a moment. Obviously, it's against Tampa Bay in the playoffs. A little bit of physicality there uh, at the end with Winfield Jr., Tight end, fullback, same side here. So the Bucks have rolled the strong safety up out of their base defensive personnel. You can see you've got five defensive linemen, well, three defensive linemen, two outside linebackers, and then two inside linebackers. So three, four personnel with the strong safety rolled up to the tight end side. And Jared Goff doesn't check out of it. He just says, okay, this, this is what we're running with. This is where we're going. And that was part of the thing about that game plan that I don't want to say surprised me, but I was really – pleased to see was that they maintained their physicality against the Bucks defense that really shut down the run the first time they played, obviously, in week six. Same play, end zone angle, so you can see what I'm talking about. Strong safety, fullback lined up to each other. Everybody else is big on big from an offensive line and tight end standpoint. And look at how quickly these guys have comboed up to the inside linebackers. Forgive me if I'm pausing it uh, too much, but I like to illustrate what those guys have done. I'll let that one run back one more time. How quickly they're able to combo up to the second level just forces those inside linebackers having uh, no good choice. And in this case, cuts it off of the backside block here by the right guard. And it's over already. Winfield just didn't know it. Would you have thought that he would have over 900 yards rushing? 
I think, 10 total touchdowns and plus 50 catches as a rookie. Would you have guessed that last year in the draft? I would have said that it was a high possibility. I don't know that I would have picked that because I didn't know exactly what the offense was going to look like with David Montgomery and Jameer Gibbs there. And and who knew that Sam Laporta was going to have a historic season uh, for a tight end? I'm sure some people did. I did not. I don't know that I would have guessed over 900 yards rushing, almost 1,000, I think 945, and over 50 catches. I would have probably guessed in the 750 to 850 range, but potentially with more carries, it was easy to see based on his one season at Alabama that this was a guy who could make plays against NFL talent because he did that in the SEC. There's no reason why he can't exceed, have higher numbers, and that's the beauty, if you ask me, of having both Montgomery and Gibbs on the roster and under contract for at least uh, two more seasons, I believe, in case of Gibbs and three, two more seasons in the case of Montgomery, excuse me, and three in the case of Gibbs because it's a a four-year deal with the option for a fifth. And that, to me, is something to mention when you're talking about drafting a talent like Jameer Gibbs. Is that fifth-year option that comes with him being a first-round pick. You would love to have that with Sam Laporta and Brian Branch, clearly. You'd like to have that additional year um, as an option to retain him. I think the The Lions are set up, and I totally agree with what Brad Holmes said in his press conference last week, that they don't feel like they have to draft any particular position. My only caveat with that would be I think you've got to look at upgrading the outside corner position significantly. So if that's done before the draft in free agency, then, 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 then great. I don't know that it will be. I have no idea what what the Lions are looking to do. But you've got to upgrade the position talent there. They did so in last year's draft in a historic manner. Uh, can you recreate the quality and depth of that draft? I think anyone would be hard-pressed to do so. Are they going to trade and manipulate and move around some? Drafting later in the first round is clearly a different deal than having pick six and pick 18 was last year. Some would say you were playing with house money anyway, so trading back from six to 12 wasn't a big deal. You can't do that this year. I think that Brad Holmes and those guys know exactly what they're doing. Uh, Their track record, his track record, personally, should be taken into account. One thing I really enjoyed about his press conference last week was how he said, those players that we selected, those were our favorite players in the draft. I think he was kind of explaining his reaction, pounding the table, and then I think slapping Dan Campbell, or, or maybe he even hurt Campbell's arm or something. And he also said, they did what we expected them to do. I think he's being completely truthful, and I'm, I'm glad that you have those guys in charge of the franchise or in charge of the personnel piece because when they see a talent like a Jameer Gibbs, they see it before we did, meaning they knew what he was capable of immediately and impacting a team that very easily could have made it to the Super Bowl, and I think it has an opportunity to be a Super Bowl team for multiple years uh, in the future. Man, I I enjoyed making this video. It was a lot of fun. I wish I could have delayed some of these videos until later in the offseason because there does become a time where it's it's difficult to think of content ideas. I have some. If you have any others, please let me know. But this was a fun one for me to try to produce. Please let me know if you think I hit on all the notes that are needed to encompass or summarize Jameer Gibbs' rookie season, which I think was spectacular. And the only reason he didn't exceed a thousand touches and twelve to fifteen a thousand yards, excuse me, and twelve to fifteen touchdowns was because of the number of touches, because you have another quality back in David Montgomery who uh, can grind people out in a somewhat different manner than Jameer Gibbs can. Appreciate you guys' time, man. If you think other Lions fans would enjoy this film study look at Jameer Gibbs' rookie season, then please consider grabbing a link to this video, sharing it out on social media to help other Lions fans enjoy this video as well.